وبشرح صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send peace and blessings upon our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family, his companions, and those who follow them until the end of time. Brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, it's good to see people up about early in the morning. You know, um, usually people get upset. They say, oh, there's no one here. But we should be happy with the people who are here. So for those of you who were able to wake up and get your coffee or your tea um, or whatever it is that you use to uh, start your day and make it early, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. You have a very good quality. Um, that you should like thank Allah for. That's the quality that you are disciplined um, and you showed up. So barakallahu feekum and may Allah like increase you. I think sometimes like people don't hear good things about themselves, you know? But that's like awesome. I don't know if I was your age, if I would have been here. Uh, you can hear by my voice um, this early. So may Allah reward you and bless you. And that's really the effort uh, that's needed. Um, in studying and teaching and working, um, organizing, um, needs sacrifice. So may Allah bless you. As my teacher used to say, khayru You know, like knowledge is the best thing you can work for. So may Allah bless every step that you took and every effort that you made to come, inshallah. So we were reading yesterday from this book, Aqeerah Tawhidiyya of Sheikh Ahmad Dardir. Uh, the book is called um, a creed that's like a, the creed of Islamic theology. We talked about this kind of trajectory of Sunni uh, theology coming from two directions. Um, and that in the second book that I will, so for each subject matter, there's three books. Thank you so much. For each subject matter, there's three books. So this is the introductory book. And then for each subject also, we have it for different demographics. So you'd have the three books for teens, the three books for converts, the three books for divorcees, the three books for millionaires, the three books for the sinner, the three books, you name it. So we believe that education needs to be student driven, but then also student focused. So the one here is for teens, right? So it's somewhat introductory and still not completed. But then the second book talks about in more detail the history of theology. Um, and the development of how you have now this really unfortunate, irresponsible division um, that you may see symptoms of as young Muslims, but you may not really understand why it's happening. You may see symptoms of it as a convert, but you don't understand why it's happening. So our goal is that when you study, you're able to be someone who can treat the symptoms. You understand? So it's not simply like, man, why does the Ummah hate itself? You can be like, I know why the Ummah is hating itself. Here, here's a Tylenol, right? Here's how you can treat it. And we said that that historical trajectory comes from two experiences. One experience is the experience of the Muslims in the second century that are having to immediately engage with philosophers, people who are Greek philosophers, pagans, fire worshipers, Christians, Jews, Buddha, you name it. So Iraq is the center of the world at that time. Intellectually, every type of philosophy is coming through Iraq. And there's something interesting about this theology as it grew, the school, theological school. And I want you to think about this as an American Muslim, what this means to you. Do you think that this school in the second century uh, was crafted when the numbers of Muslim citizens were a majority or a minority? So for example, in Iraq, second century, Fustat, which is now Cairo. If you're from Egypt, Cairo is Fustat. Um, Damascus, Syria. May Allah bless the people of Syria, inshallah. Palestine, in these areas. Do you think that the Muslims, even though the government was ran by Muslims, the demographic of those states, Muslims were still a minority. This is a great argument also against Islamophobes. You tell them, well, like, we didn't just show up in countries and suddenly become like the dominant demographic. We were the minority. So this is interesting for you to think about. Qira'at, which people are doing now. Fiqh, hadith, theology, Arabic language. The major sciences that you study, 
the early books written by people like Al-Baqilani, like Imam Ahmed and others were written at a time when the number of Muslims were less than the number of non-Muslims. So in many ways the earlier books may provide you a robust set of experiences that you won't find in the medieval period after the Crusades. Because the Crusades turns the world into what? Into imperialism, into war. So like during war, you're not like, hey, can we do like an interfaith gathering and like talk about how we can work together and like argue our positions? That's not the case. But in the second century in the Muslim Islamic history, third century of Islamic history, you have to understand something. When Bukhari comes from our Samarkand, goes south, as he's traveling through quote unquote Muslim lands, he's a minority. Although the state is a Muslim state. So that's why sometimes in the classical texts, you'll find discussions that may be re very relevant to you now in this country and to me now in this country because we are interacting with so many different types of people. So that's where this school comes from and that's why this school focuses on rationalism in order to argue with these people and bring them closer to faith and also to deal with the doubts that these people had put in the hearts of the Muslims. Does it sound like a familiar time to you? On the other end, you have a textual school that primarily comes out of Medina. And Imam Malik, is our Imam, really leads this effort. And of course, Medina is a monolith. Medina is 99.9% .9 Muslim. So at the same time, that, so we don't get lost in the idea of being hip and cool and liberal and interpretive, we also have to respect this school to keep us grounded. So there's benefits in both. But as we mentioned, the goal of, of this school is to help us in our relationship with Allah, which deals with doubts, also deals with curiosity, and deals with our desires, and also prepares us for public life. The Prophet وسلم, a man, he came to him, Sahih Muslim, and he had doubts. You know, it's okay to doubt. Like, the problem with the doubt is if you just don't try to find an answer to it, and then it, it can consume you, right? It can consume you. Um, for parents who have children who go through doubts, you know, I believe like, there has to be a relationship with the Imam, there has to be a relationship with institutions that offer, like when I was in Boston as Imam, youth don't need office hours, so you just come through. Like if I'm busy, I'm busy, right? It's like that access has to be there. Um, and this man, he asked the Prophet this question and Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, he said, you know, it's too, it's too horrendous to mention to you what I'm thinking. Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, said, are you sure? He said, yeah, like seriously, it's like a really bad idea. Imam Muslim puts this hadith under the chapter on doubt. Imam Muslim is brilliant. And then the Prophet said, like, really, really, you're struggling, like, with this issue. And he said, yeah, he said, that is sarih al-iman. The Prophet said to him, like, that's pure faith, like, that battle, right, that battle. As for desires, we know, Allah says, wala tattabi' ahwa'ahum amma ja'aka min al-haq, right, don't follow your desires. That's why the word for desires, hawa, means to fall. Wa najmi iza, hawa, because someone who follows their desires will eventually slip and fall, right? And then the third uh, is public life. These verses of Quran I'm reading now say, you know, proclaim the message of your Lord, argue in a better way, discuss in a better way, right? Engagement, public life. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا the seventh chapter of the Quran says, Oh human beings, oh, oh humanity, I am the messenger of God sent to all of you. And we have to remember something in America. When we give up in da'wah, we will be shamed. And when we fail to call to the truth, we will be called to falsehood. This is just how life works. It doesn't mean you go out and start going crazy, you know. Like you could be having a hijab tutorial, that's awesome da'wah. Like seriously, right? You'd be talking about like, you know, how to make ma'luba, you know? And people benefit from you. And they, they realize like, subhanAllah, like I'm, I'm taking khair from people. 
you know, you may be out in an activist compa capacity. Like that's, you don't have to go to people and be like, believe in Allah or die, you know? But you live your life. You may be an athlete, you may be a gamer, you may be a sheikh, right? Right, Yaqub said, go through different doors. So we went through seven qualities that we believe, what are called sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are held by this school, that are really universal. They're universal principles. They're meta-logic, rooted in text. And the first one who remembers what it was, why well, sneak this coffee? What was the first obligation that we have to believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Almost. Yeah, good. He exists. Al wujud. Afwan. Al wujud. Sometimes my Egyptian kicks in. Al wujud. That he exists. And we say actually about Allah's existence, wajibul wujud. And if I had time, I would talk to you about something remarkable that the school, when it uses the word wajib, it means two types of wajib. And this goes back to the early Meccan period when the Prophet وسلم, is using revelation and using logic. And also in Medina, وسلم, when they say wajib, they actually did something remarkable. Wajib aqli wa wajib shari. I'm not going to have time to talk about this now. You could take the course online, inshallah. We're going to offer something like Netflix, where we do like all the Ezhar curriculum in English for only $2 a month, inshallah. Uh, we believe all prophets were non-profit. Right? I mean, we want to get paid because we want to produce things, but like, I, I, I'm passionate about education. It's what I do. It's my degree. Like, I love teaching. Right? So you, as I said yesterday, if you love teaching, you love poverty, mashallah. Um, but there is an approach at this school when they use the word wajib, they meant wajib, everyone knows what wajib means? An obligation. Wajib means an obligation. They meant a, an obligation which is rooted in a logical conclusion and an obligation which is rooted in Islam. So they said the existence of God, and you would take this in the second book, is a logical obligation. And at the same time, the Quran says, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'abudani, I am Allah. So now imagine if you learn this school well, and you equip yourself with an approach that's rooted in kind of like this rationalistic approach, it's not perfect, and textual approach, and you go into non-Muslim society, you're going to be hard to deal with. Because you'll have understood already, as happens in larger texts, many of the arguments of the philosophers about atheism. So when we use the word wajib al wujud, it means wajib aqlan wa wajib shar'an. So that's why post enlightenment, everybody knows the enlightenment. We're in a post enlightenment world, right? As they say. Religions have struggled to find the balance between rationalism and religion. How is it that our scholars over a thousand years ago married both of those together and responded to many of even the contemporary arguments of philosophy? How is it that we are not uniquely positioned historically to do great things in this country for people? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Like it's actually very powerful and profound that our scholars were able to bring both together a thousand years ago. And that's what this school did. Because it had to, because it's engaging fire worshipers, Hindus, Jews, Christians, pagans, heathens with impunity. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's engaging everyone. And also what that does, especially for us as Muslims, man, I do this as a convert. Because when I go home, I'm not Suhaib, I'm William, man. My relatives are not, they know Imam, nah, ain't none of that. It's like, that's big will, man. Come here and shut up. What y'all Muslims doing nowadays? You want some pork bacon? Like, joke with me and stuff. Like, nah, the turkey bacon, dude. But it's my family, so they say it in a funny way. Um, but I find myself having to censor myself at times. What W.D. Du Bois talked about, the idea of the double psychology, 
the double consciousness of black folks he wrote about 100 years ago in America, and not to appropriate anyone's cultural experiences. There's a double consciousness to being a Muslim in America. And this book will give you confidence, right? And this approach will give you some confidence so you, you feel you can engage people. You can stay rational. You can keep your emotions in check. So the first, al-wujud. Allah exists. Wajib al-wujud. You want to write that down if you have the book in front of you. An intellectual obligation, a logical conclusion, and a religious conclusion. I'll share one more thing with you, just, just to like open your mind a little bit. Our scholars approach knowledge from two perspectives. Knowledge which is self-evident, meaning the conclusion of the knowledge is self-evident. And knowledge which has to be proven. The conclusion has to be proven. This school did this. For example, self-evident knowledge would be you're here. Like, for someone would turn to you and say, like, Muhammad, you're here right now. And then Muhammad was like, what's the Dalil, man? Like, <laughs> you think you're here? Like, I need Dalil, man. <laughs> you're right in front of me. I really want you to listen to this because this is really awesome. I know it's early. But if I were to say to you, I just saw Muhammad outside, around the table, buy Sheikh uh, Auda's books, which are amazing, you should buy them. You would say to me, what? I, I didn't see him. Are you sure he's there? And I'll be like, yeah, look, let's, like, let's Snapchat him and see if, like, if he responds. Where he's at. So now I'm using what to prove that he's there. This is evidence. So this school says that knowledge which is self-evident is knowledge, that, or the conclusions of knowledge which are self-evident do not need proof. The light's on up there. Don't need proof for it. You exist. Things which are beyond your five senses. Conclusions that are generally beyond your five senses need proof. So the first is called ilm al-dururi, self-evident knowledge. The second is called ilm al-nadhari, meaning knowledge that you have to put some, you have to like research, you have to like prove it, you have to engage it, you, you have to come to a conclusion. There's like a theory and a hypothesis. You've got to kind of put some effort into it. Here's something I want you to think about. We said the first obligation is to learn. So I'm going to try to tie this in front of you really quickly. Where do you think they put God, Muslim theologians, self-evident or knowledge that you have to like investigate and find proof for? All right, if you think it's the first one, raise your hand. Don't look around first. But yeah, me, I get it. If you think it's self-evident, you can raise your hand. Awesome. If we had time, we'd ask why, and we'd engage you, and we'd benefit from you. I believe, really, the best time to teach is when you listen to people, right? How many of you believe that, according to majority of Muslim scholars, theologians, the conclusion of God's existence is based on ilm al nadhari investigative knowledge? How many of you didn't raise your hand? It's like the majority. There's the people who voted for Trump, like, no, I didn't vote for nobody, man. <laughs> <laughs> he says, like, the majority of people voted for him. And the prophet said, you know, evil is what you hate people to know about you. Just saying. So, if God's existence was self-evident, why would he send prophets in books? What's the purpose of prophets in books? To teach you about what? teach you about God. So then obviously you have to learn about God too. So the majority, and this is powerful when you're dealing with atheists and powerful when you're dealing with Islamophobes and if you're especially in the academy, you can say the fundamental approach to is about Islam takes towards God is number one, knowledge is an obligation because God is proven. God comes through a process of cognition and, of course, bringing tawfiq and hidayah to the heart. So that's why when I said earlier it's an obligation, meaning an intellectual obligation and a religious obligation, 
The intellectual obligation is rooted in the idea that the overwhelming majority of Sunni scholars, including the other school, said that you have to learn about God. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ That's very powerful. Because now you can, if you're an Islamic studies teacher, you know, whenever you take a job at a school, ask about the educational philosophy of the school. But your educational philosophy should be one that welcomes engagement, which most of our great teachers are doing. May Allah give it up for them, alhamdulillah. As a parent, children coming and ask you some crazy questions. I tell people, ask me, who asks you the most difficult questions? My daughter, man. My daughter got zingers for days, you know? And, but that's a good place to be in if they trust you enough to ask you these questions. Right? Because if you think about Maslow, he's this philosopher, says the student has to be comfortable before they'll learn from you. Right? So your kids are comfortable with you. But if we understand that the idea of God is rooted in ilm al nadhari proofs and engagement, why he sent the Quran and prophets is to teach us about him, to make us think about him, to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Quran and sunnah, then we'll really appreciate the robust opportunity to be educators to engage young people, and to encourage them to ask questions. You got it? Everybody with me? It's deep, but it's dope. It's like really awesome. It's very empowerful, very empowering. So Al-Wujud, the first Allah exists. We said the proof for it. Uh, the second book goes to quite a few examples that they bring forth. But simply, we talk about the idea of creation, that creation had a cause. Uh, nothing can cause itself. So obviously, you have to go back to some kind of supreme cause. The idea also is since that cause is not in the physical world and it caused all the physical world, then it's outside of physical laws. And that's where they take you. Think about it. Early scholars were talking about physics and atoms, right, to take you to God. Nowadays, people run from science. How do they prove it scripturally? Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'abudani wa aqim salata li dhikri. I'm Allah. The verse says. Thirdly, they bring a rational proof. They say, how is it possible that these men and women who were prophets, that's a long discussion, never met each other, didn't speak the same language, came from different places, different times, different countries, but they all called to the same thing. It's not really, there's only one place the iPhone came from, that's Silicon Valley. But if there was like a million iPhones coming from all these different places and they never met each other, that'd be freaking crazy. It was the exact phone with the little differences on the apps. Angry Birds, Madden, whatever. The skinny selfie thing, makes you look skinnier. Whatever the apps are, might be a little different, but the phone is the phone. So he says it's not logically possible for these people to have never met, to never have communicated, yet they call to the same foundational principles of belief. God, angels, books, hellfire, qada and qadr. Hada la yumkin. The opposite of existence would be that he doesn't exist. Al-Adam. The next we said that he has no beginning because he's outside of physical laws. So Al-Qadam. The word in the Quran for Qadam, Al-Awwal. I know if you understand Arabic, Al-Qadam means old. These people, they have their own terminology, so just don't get upset. One time I said Al-Qadam, this woman thought I was calling old an audience, man. I was like, la ya am man. Khalat was like upset. I was like, no, I didn't call you old. It's in the word, in the book. Al Qadam means Al Awlawiya. He has no beginning. The, the third, Al Baqa. No ending. Because it's outside of physical laws. So this has to deal with his essence. These first three attributes deal with Allah as Allah. He exists, he's outside of physical laws. The third, or fourth, sorry, mukhalif al-hawadith, mukhalif in opposition to created and evolved things. And that's extremely important as we talk about other qualities. And we said that's in three areas. Who remembers? Bidhatu, his essence, his attributes, and his actions. So he doesn't share with others. What you should be feeling as we go through these seven, is like, yo, I need to pray to Hajj tonight. 
Like that should really be the outcome of studying this kind of stuff. Like I need to go be good to my mom. You know, Sheikh Ahmed Rafa'i, one of the great scholars of Egypt, he said, I looked at Dawah and I saw two ways. One is like really popular Instagram likes, you know, which is good, don't get me wrong, those things are important, but that's not the purpose why we do what we do. You know, speaking, taking pictures with people, signing books, you know, everybody would want to do that. He said, but then I looked at the other side of Dawah, service, standing up for justice, creating sustainable models for people in education, financial opportunity, caring for the poor, looking after the old. Like we should have a Meals on Wheels in Bridgeview, you know what I'm saying? For the old people, you know, in New York. A lot of old Muslims who just eat alone. It's like sad, man. It's like have a meal with somebody. He said, I looked at that way, فَإِذَا هُوَ فَرِقْ Nobody was over there. Nobody wants to do this stuff. Nobody wants to do the work Iman does in Chicago, for example. Right? That's real work. Shekifah. That's real work. So when I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mukhalifun al hawadith, I'm gonna I'm gonna place like my aspirations to Allah. I'm gonna realize nothing is like him, nothing is more awesome than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa ka mithlihi shay. There's nothing like Allah. And I have a relationship with Allah. So then I'll, when I miss Fajr, I feel like I miss checking the Bitcoin, you know, every day. Like, I feel like I lost something, like, because this is Allah, like, this is incredible, transcendent God who opened up a door for me to have a relationship with him. That's why when you open prayer, what's the dua called for opening the prayer? It's tiftah. You open the door. The door has been opened for you. فَنَطَرَبْتُ from Allah. I'm looking for, and that's why the masjid's called mihrab, because you fought your soul, you did war on yourself to be able to pray to Allah. It's incredible. So I take mukhalifun al hawadith, should increase my tawakkul, my ta'alluq, my trust, and my attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the Prophet would say, like, the more he learned, the more generous he became. Transformative knowledge. Qa'im bin nafs. Next, Allah is independent. Does whatever he wants. Fa'alu lima yurid. It's going to help me deal with providence, hardship, difficulty. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? I'll leave it to Allah. Even if it hurts. The next, al-ghina. The one who provides all things for us. The hadith says, you know, if you... If, if the first of you and the last of you, and all human beings and all jinn, ask me and I gave you, it would not take anything from me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last, al wahdaniyah that Allah is one. One in his essence, one in his attributes, one in his actions. So we went over that last night. The purpose of those seven things is to give us a sense of awe. A sense of like, wow. And also to help us explain publicly our faith around God. If someone really ponders on all these 20 attributes, I'm telling you, 80, 90% of the questions I get from people are the answers in there. Just have to think. The next seven are meant to bring the sense of nearness to us. So the first is to give us the idea of uluhiyya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's transcendence. The second seven are meant to give us the feeling of qurba. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَارِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah said in the Quran, I'm close to you. And that brings up a question a lot of people ask me. How do I know if God cares about me? It's like a great question, man. It's a question of like someone who loves Allah. You know, I was, I was traveling once and there's this, uh, I'm gonna say her name. You guys know Marwa Bakar, the girl who wrote the essay to Donald Trump from California. So she came to me, I had no idea who she was. I'm old. And she's like, I need to ask you a question. She's a millennial like you guys, so I got scared. Um, 
And then, no offense. And then she said to me, like, I need to ask you a question. And, I, and then she said, do you know me? And I said, I don't know who you are. I'm sorry. I was with Ahmed. And she said to me, you know, I wrote the letter to Trump about immigration, my parents, my family, for Sarkasians, they immigrated here. Man, she asked me a question that I hear the most from all of you, which is like the question of really sincere people, man. My respect, I didn't know who she was, then I found out she didn't even tell me who she was, like that's so cool, like she didn't use her platform. Like where is that now? Where's the idea of like hiding yourself? Like where's the idea of being sincere only for Allah? Like we're so projected. We're in an age of exhibition. It's like Ringling Brothers, man. It's like always, you know, which is good, but there also has to be time where like you're close to God, man. So she said to me, how do I know I'm doing this for Allah? Man, what a question. As though the earth shook, man. And then she said, how do I know Allah cares about me? That's like the most common question I get from people. So we talk about the next seven qualities that remind us how close Allah is to us. These seven qualities should generate two emotions. Number one is fear. We should be careful like you're being watched. Like the song says, you are not alone. You know, Imam Adirja says, وَغَلِّبَ well, الْخَوْفَ عَلَى الرَّجَائِ وَلَا تَيْأَسْ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ الْغَفَارِ Yes, Salam. In this poem, Sheikh Dardiri said, you know, let fear overcome hope. What he means is if like you feel you're going to sin or do something wrong or do something evil, then use the antibiotic of fear. Like if you're at this convention, you're like, yo, tonight in Chicago is going to be lit. Fear Allah. On the other end, there may be times where you need hope to overcome fear. So if I'm like feeling really down, I'm depressed, I feel like I'm going to give up hope, like there's no hope for me, my parents or my kids like drive me crazy, my marriage is struggling, whatever, then I give hope first. So that's why Ibn Qayyim said, fear and hope are like two wings of a bird. You can't fly without one wing, with, with one of the wings going. So fear and hope are like wings of your iman, but you, we use them. If I feel like, you know what? I really want to watch, I really, really, really want to watch, you know, the rest of uh, The Office. My wife and I have been binge watching The Office, right? Love The Office. Do Jim and Pam really get married? I don't know yet, don't tell me. So, because my wife was like, there's a show called The Office. I was like, man, that show's for nerds. And she's like, no, no, you got to watch. It's like freaking amazing. So we started watching it, and then I'm like, next, next, you know? But then it's like, it's 11.30 at night, buddy. You didn't pray Fajr? One more, one more. Fuck that moment. Khauf. Fear God. You know? As a convert, I remember, I was in a masjid learning Arabic, and this one Ammo came to me and he's like, you know, I think you non-Arabs will never speak Arabic. You know, it doesn't mean all Arabs are like this. I love Arabs. He's just a bully. You know, but I got super despondent. I was like, man, what kind of ummah is this? Like, you're supposed to be getting my back, dude. Like, I'm trying to learn Arabic, it's like hecka hard to say gha when you're white, you know? And then at that moment, like, you need hope. So there's time for hope and fear. So what should come out of these seven qualities is either hope or fear, and using them strategically. And the third would be, you're never alone, like, Allah has your back. So he says, walhaya. The eighth quality, Allah is living. The opposite would be death. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyu al qayyum. Third chapter of the Quran begins there is no God except Allah the living. What allows the Prophet, as you study the seerah, to maintain a sense of optimism are these profound qualities. What allows the Prophet, as he enters in Mecca, I'm supposed to talk about this right now, what allows him to stay humble is he knows he's responsible. He's going, he has to live responsibly. And I want you to think about something. How many of you know about the Hadith of Jibreel? You know, when Jibreel asked the Prophet, great, mashallah, well, that's awesome. The Prophet says, ask, is asked three questions. What's the last question? What's Ihsan? 
And, and, and Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Fataha lana bab Malakut He opens up the door to Allah With this answer He says An ta'bur Allah ka'annaka tara huh? To worship Allah as though you see him These seven qualities are called Sifat al-Muhsineen The qualities that bring about Ihsan The qualities that help you worship Allah as though you see him Even though you can't see him so if I like, man, the world sucks, like, oh, everything's happening, oh my God, like, seals are dying in Alaska, and like, I don't know, my, and the canned homos taste horrible, and like, you know, Allah is there, he's alive. The next, wal ilm, Allah knows all things. But his, his living is beyond time and space, you have to go back to the first seven, Allah is alive, qidam wal baqa, no beginning, no end, mukhalifun al hawadith, he's not like creation, so his life is different than our life. His knowledge, no beginning, no end, it's the opposite of creation, so his knowledge is not like our knowledge, it's transcendent knowledge. So you take these seven, and whenever you feel the, tensity, the, the propensity to say like, is he like us, is he like creation, you go back to the first seven, you see how they help you out. And if you get in the first seven, you're like, man, I just feel so far away from Allah, you go to the second seven. So you balance the sense of transcendence with a sense of nearness. So the outcome of the first should be al-uluhiya. The outcome of these should be ubudiya, if you understand Arabic. The outcome of the first seven should be like, la ilah illallah. The outcome of the second should be worship and service وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ So knowledge, how should knowledge impact us? Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, once he found this young shepherd boy, he was illiterate, he's from the lower economic totem pole, he was got, uh, shepherding a man's sheep. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he said, hey man, give me some of your sheep. He didn't know who Omar was. There was no Instagram back then. Omar didn't have a lit on Instagram with a blue dot next to his name. And then he said, I can't give you these sheep because our Lord will get mad. My Lord will get angry. He said, La, Rabbu Kumushma, like, your Lord's not here. He's on the other side of the farm. He said, La, Ya Sheikh, I mean Rabbu Samawat. He said, No, I mean the Lord of everything. He will know if I did this. That's the outcome of knowledge. Knowing that Allah knows will protect me from evil internally and externally. The opposite of that will be ignorance. The next, al irada, a will. Yuridu Allahu bikum yusra wa la yuridu bikum al usra. Quran says Allah wants, He wills that things are easy for you. He wills that things are facilitated. How did that happen? Through prophets, through books, through engagement. The opposite of that would be that he has no purpose. It's like created like, ما خلقنا السماوات والأرض وما بينهما باطلة. The Quran says we didn't create all this for nothing. The next one, قدرة, power and authority. All power comes from Allah. How should that impact you, man? That, sh that should really give you a sense of purpose, man, to live for something higher. You gotta be a change maker. Push yourself, dream. My daughter asked me, what's the worst thing I can do? I said, don't have ambition. What do you mean? I said, nah, man, have ambition. She said, what if you don't like what I decide? I said, that's my fault. That's not your fault, that's my fault. I'm not you. I don't like pizza that's this thick. I live in New York. Like it, this stick. My daughter's like, that's crazy. But have ambition. When the Prophet said to his Sahaba, when you ask for Jannah, ask for, for the highest level. Ask for Firdaus al A'la. Like, have ambition. Allah, ha Allah is all powerful. And inshallah, if Allah wills, you can do whatever you want. Mm. Right. Can I just ask for like the lowest level? You can, but like have ambition. You know, work for the first, get the last. 
That's how I look at it. You know, and if you look through Islamic history, the seerah is really the embodiment of someone trusting in the power of Allah. Fatih Mecca. That's why the Prophet can be graceful in the conquering of Mecca, because it's not me. I don't, I'm not, my ego is not in this. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. Kullu min Allah. It came from Allah. So I don't, I don't have a personal stake in it. There's a great king in Andalus, we don't have a lot of time. His name was Muhammad ibn Amr. Muhammad ibn Amr was a humar, not as you understand the word. And fusha, meaning he's the guy who took your groceries on his donkey. So he had a donkey, there were no grocery carts, so he'd show up at your house with his donkey. And sometimes in Masr, they have these guys that roll, Ya Lemon, you know those guys with the donkeys? Ay, Sabah al Fool, right? Those people. Even they sell tea. So amazing. Um, so Muhammad ibn Amr was a donkey man. It's like a donkey man. He works with donkeys, man. He's 14 years old. He's sitting with his friends one night in a, in a hut outside of Qurtuba. This is in the second century. And he says, one day I'm going to be the king of Spain. And they were like, <laughs> yeah, right. You. He said, wallahi, when I became king of Spain, what will you ask me? First one said, I'll ask you for horses. Second one said, I'll ask you for gardens. The third one said, you're crazy. And he said, no, no, just like, you know, just imagine if I become king of Spain. He said, okay, wallahi. And you know, back in those days, wallahi is your signature. So if you say wallahi in front of the king, he has to enforce it. So he says, wallahi, if you become king of Spain, put me on a donkey, turn me backwards, ask people to pelt me with vegetables, because this dumb person is their king. He said, are you sure about that? He said, wallahi. He said, okay. <clears throat> he became a policeman. He realized being a donkey man isn't strategically in his best interest. He became a policeman of Qurtuba. He worked for 10 years. He became chief of police. At that time, the king of Spain died, and the Amuis, because a'udhu billahi minhum, we know how the Amwis are, they're always worried about power, got together and said, what? We need to choose someone who can be the king of Spain who nobody knows, Nasabuhu Majhul. Like nobody knows who he is. He has no, like, no strong family ties. So the guy said, I, I know the best person for this. In fact, they say he used to be a donkey man. The chief of police of Qurtuba. He became king of Spain. At that time, the Khalifa, at that time, Spain, Al-Andalus, is not an Arabic word. It's a Berbery word, which means Bilad al-Mujrimin. The Arabs used to be scared of Andalus. Andalus was like, that side of town. So the Moroccans were like, don't go there. If you go there, you will never return. It was known to be wild. Them Europeans were but crazy. So he decides to put in a 30-year plan to change Spain. He did it, keeping it short, because we're talking about Allah's power. And he changes his name to Al-Mansur. Al-Mansur, the first Mansur. If you read about him, what does Mansur mean? The one who is helped by the power of God. He keeps, his, he keeps this in his life, this quality of Allah's power. So he always stays humble. That's functional Tawheed. Don't get your success twisted, man. That's how the Prophet is humble on the Fatah of Mecca. Because he knows it's not from me. I'm just an Asian and all this. I'm trying my best, but the barak is from Allah. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ Then, after 30 years, he put the first 10 years to knowledge, deen, the second 30 years, education, the, third, third, the second, uh, last 10 years, excuse me, to military. So he divides his rule into 30 years. Religion, knowledge, military. He focuses, he brings scholars from all over the world, Jews, Christians, Ula, then Spain becomes the Spain that you see now on postcards. After 30 years, he's sitting in his court with his people, and they say to him, you know, how are you doing? He's old, he's in the 60s. He says to them, you know what I used to do? They say, yeah, I used to be a chief of police. Before that, you were a policeman. He's like, no, 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 no. Before that, I love this person. They say, what? He said, I used to be a donkey man. They started rolling. It's like one of those YouTube clips, like, oh, like that's the moment. They all lost it. He said, okay, you don't believe me? Guards, you're going to go to this hut in Qurtaba. You're going to find these three losers. They're going to be doing the same thing they were doing when I left them. If they're not dead, bring them to me. Sure enough, people without ambition and people without drive are going to stay donkey men. That's just how it is. So these three dudes are still there with their donkeys. A little bit of arthritis, but with their donkeys. They brought them, this is a true story, it's a book called Tariq al-Andalus. They brought them into his 
court and they saw him and the first two were like, I knew it, I knew it, I going to do it. I knew it, man, I love you, bro, what's up? It's my boy. Third one was like, who's that, man? He said, you know who these three guys are? These are my friends. He's very humble. And then thank you, man, you don't have to bring coffee, man. Thank you so much, mashallah. Shai Masri, kada So, anyone from Egypt know about Shai Miza? If you know about Shai Miza, you hood. If you know about, know, know about Shai Miza, you are not hood. It has the perfect amount of milk and coffee, so it's like Miza. And they can make it like wave in the glass, it's crazy. Anyways, sorry, ADD kicking in. So Muhammad ibn Amr, the three guys walk in and they're like, yo, what's up? My boy was cracking. Third guy's like, no, I've never seen him in my life. These are my friends. He said, hey, you remember that night? Remember what you asked me? First guy said, yeah, I asked you for, for uh, what was it? Horses. He said, give it to him. Second guy, I ask you for gardens. Give it to him. Third guy, I forgot. He said, no, no, man, just tell him, just tell him. He's like, you know, Muhammad, we were just playing around. This is a long time ago. He said, no, but you swore an oath, and I'm the king, and I have to enforce the oath, bro. So finally, he says, what he, what he asked him to do, and he said, give it to him and teach him, in Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. And then he read this verse of Quran. He said, give it to him and recite to him the verse that Allah is all powerful. I couldn't have done this without Allah. That's the outcome of Qudra. So the whole seerah, when you're reading it, why is the Prophet able to be calm? Why are they not losing it? You know, is he understands power from Allah. I just have to work hard. The next, as sama wal basar, Allah hears and sees all things. What's the outcome of that? I should stay away from sin. I should be careful what I think and feel. I should monitor my soul. You know, the scholars say, there's really like three types of people. People who monitor their thoughts here, right? People who monitor their hearts. People who monitor their thoughts and their deeds, right? It's normal. And then there's a higher level of people who monitor even how they feel. I, mean, I shouldn't feel like this, man. Stuff for Allah. Even though we're not called to account for our thoughts, but they train their thoughts and their souls to be positive. And this takes us to the last seven qualities of God and their opposites. And these last seven are repetitive or repeat the second se seven, but they're phrased in a way that gives the feeling of consistency. So, wakonuhu hayyan, meaning Allah has always lived. So, when you say Allah is alive, you may think, well, he, like, is that like, Temperance there, or wakonuhu hayyan, yani da'iman. And the outcome of these seven should be consistency in your life. Because it goes back to the question that Marwa asked me How do I know Allah cares about me? Al Muhasibi gives the answer, he said, In tuhib and ta'rif manzilataka indallah, fa'rif manzilatahu andak. Al Muhasibi said, If you want to know if God cares about you, ask yourself, Do you care about God? means choices, the kind of choices I make. So if I'm gonna choose between something evil and something good, I have to remember one day I have to choose between heaven and hell. Someone will choose for me. That's what he means. So konuhu hayyan, meaning Allah is always alive. No beginning, no ending. Wa konuhu aliman, he knows everything. It's not like he knew a little, didn't know a little for God. Wa ma rabbuka nasiya. The Quran says Allah didn't forget anything. Muridan, his will, it doesn't like go up and down. It doesn't fluctuate. It was, will be, and always is. His knowledge was, will be, and always is. It doesn't evolve. It doesn't grow. It doesn't change. He's Allah. It's infinite. It has no limit. So now we understand. La ilaha illallah. Sami'an basiran. Bikulli shay. He hears and sees, did hear, does hear, and will hear. Will always hear. Will always know. In a way that's befitting his majesty. 
ليس كمثل شيء. Not like us. Not like creation. And متكلمن. This takes us now. You did, mashallah, 20 qualities of God. And they're opposites. So you actually learn 40 things. That's the beauty of the tradition. If you take all of the 20 that you learned and you take the opposites, the 20 that you learned are what you have to affirm. The opposites are what you deny. And that takes us to the prophets. And we'll make it quick because of time. We have a, a separate course on the third, the last quality of God, which are the mumkinat, probabilities. That deals with qada and qadr. You know, like, why am I not tall? You know, why am I short? Why am I not rich? Why am I not poor? Why am I this? What are called mumkinat. That's a long discussion. It deals with theodicy. Theodicy didn't begin with Homer. Theodicy began with Musa. Alayhi salatu wassalam. But let's move quickly to the prophets and then we'll stop because of time. We covered, mashallah, about one third of the book. Uh, unfortunately, again, it's my fault, man. Uh, the volunteers, people here have done Muhammad, really an incredible job. Uh, I'm just, because, you know, the university, I work at NYU, you know, those, anyone here in college? So you know, like, the last three weeks basically have been like torture um, for everybody involved. So I was really busy, and I didn't read my emails. Um, so it's my fault. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to come teach my book all day. And so I, was, I got here, and they were like, are you ready to teach the sirah? And I was like, whoops, sorry. So it's my fault. We all make mistakes. But if you like the class, let them know you liked it so you can cover my back a little bit. You know what I'm saying? So get a brother back. Um, we talk about the prophets. The word prophets has two, two this is the third chapter in the book. Uh, really, the word Nabi and Nabuwa comes from a word Nabwa. And the word Nabwa, Nabi is for prophet. Okay? The word Nabi is said has two meanings. Number one is news. Right? We all know the chapter Amma Yatasa'alun Anin Naba. Right? Anin Naba il Azim. They ask you about the great Naba news because obviously prophets inform us, they tell it, teach us things. The other meaning of the word Nabi is from Nabwa. And nabwa means a sharaf, an honor. Nabwa. It's in the book. Nabwa, something that you, you're honored by. So, of course, whoever follows the Prophet's teachings and adheres to great prophetic morality will be someone who's honored, inshallah, in the hereafter. It's very beautiful. When we talk about our prophets, we say there are eight obligations you have to know. They're mentioned by, in, in the second book that's not ready. Parents like, where's the second book? Second book is not ready, make dua. Editing is not like writing, man. But the second book that we'll release actually is not going to be in this series, it's gonna be in Qira'a. It's gonna be a standardized reading of Hafs because the problem is all of us are reading with the Qira'a of Hafs but not with the Tariq of Hafs, which means like we haven't mastered reading Hafs properly. How most of you read the Quran is through a narration of someone named Hafs bin Suleiman. The second book is a poem written by my teacher's teacher. We can use in Islamic schools in America to create a standardized reading of Quran with ijaza back to Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sanadi la Sayyidina Rasulillah. And then also we can train our Islamic studies teachers to make sure, listen, you're not mixing the turuq, right? You're not teaching people hafs in an inadequate way. So imagine, have a standardized text questions, answers, drills, quizzes. If you're a homeschool parent, this is amazing for you also. That standardizes one of the 10 qirat of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then after that, some other books, then the second book for this will come out. But in the second book, it's written by someone named Imam Al-Marzuqi, Al-Maliki, Al-Masri. He's a great scholar. He was the mufti of, of Mecca uh, before uh, the Saudi uh, government took over. And Imam Marzuki in his text, he talks about the eight obligations due to prophets. And these are really awesome too for like leadership forums, talk about qualities of a leader. He says, <laughs> He says in the poem that Allah sent prophets and the first quality of the prophets is fatana. The first thing we believe, oblig obligation we affirm to prophets is fatana. What does fatana mean? Intelligence. Prophets are smart. And when we use the word intelligence in theology, that means two things. This is super uber important. Not lift important, 
uber important. First, it means religious knowledge. So, yeah, religious insight because like they receive wahi from God. Number two, they have cultural competency. So prophets are sent to their people. So they understand the nuances of their people. They understand how to engage their people. So the Prophet وسلم, has religious information and cultural agency and utility. For converts, it's really important. Sometimes we convert, we kind of like give up our cultural uh, background. Brothers and sisters who come from overseas, don't give up on, I, I love the diversity in our community, man. We each have a role to play within our communities, communities. So the first is knowledge. The opposite would be that they were ignorant, ignorant of deen. The Prophet said, anything that will bring you closer to God, I taught you. Anything that will take you away from God, I warned you about it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, sidq, honesty and integrity. Prophets were honest people. And when we say honesty, we mean in three areas. Honesty in their actions, honesty in their thoughts, and honesty in their words. They're like complete sincerity. Sit bil lisan, wa sit bil adhan, wa sit bil afal. Like the prophets are honest in what they say, what they feel and what they do. It's a great quality. The opposite would be lying. They were liars. The third, a tabligh. Tabligh means to teach, to educate, to proclaim. Allah says to the Prophet, بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكْ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَاتِهِ This is one qira'a, hafs. You know, Allah says to the Prophet, you must teach people. That means that the Prophets didn't hide anything from anybody. The opposite of that would be kitman. So, you see now mass, this is beautiful. This right here is, is living one of the prophetic qualities. Access to knowledge, engagement with scholars like Omar Suleiman and Sister Yasmin. Right, that engagement is part of tabligh. The word tabligh actually comes from a word which means the, 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 the shisma. I can't think in English right now. This happens when I think in Arabic. Yani. The sponge, when it soaks up the water, this is called balagha or balagh. So tabligh means like you give it to the people, they, you soak them with the knowledge. You soak them. And the last, amana. They're trustworthy. So it took eight obligations of the prophets. And we're going to stop after this and take questions, right? Oh, I th oh, oh, man, that's why I was rushing. So these qualities are an obligation to affirm to the prophets. Number one, we said intelligence, religious intelligence, and cultural competency. Number two, that they are people of integrity and honesty. Number three, that they proclaim the message of Allah. They didn't hide anything. They didn't have special groups. Right, so as an institution, I have to make sure that, yeah, I'm gonna, if I have to charge people, I'm, I'm also going to make sure, like we have a policy, like Converse, they get the book free. It's like straight up. Unless there's like a hundred of them in the audience right now. But in general, right, because like knowledge has to be accessible. Someone can't afford it, you have to make it accessible to them. Right, and Converse, of course, can afford it. It's just I'm a convert, so I feel like, you know, we gotta, I got to pay you back a little because we're in the same boat. And then the last is what? Amana, honesty and integrity. They weren't people of like hypocrisy. They didn't say things and then act in opposition to that. So we'll take a short break, inshallah, and pick up uh, when we get back. Inshallah.